Continuing our reading in Abraham Hannibal and the Raiders of the Sands by Francis Summers Cox, Chapter 20, The Cross in the Dust. I've never seen anyone so ugly in my life, thought Abraham, as he and his friends, as well as 20 or so other prisoners from the camp, stood in front of a fine tent, their hands tied together in front of them. Dr. Ponset's ten children had managed to squirm their way next to each other and stood in a huddle, shoulder to shoulder in spite of the heat. The sun was up now, and the chill of the desert night had long since worn off. A huge heap of bales and boxes that the raiders had stolen from the camp lay to one side. A desert Arab in rich, long robes was striding slowly up and down in front of his prisoners, looking them up and down with hard, calculating eyes. A long, curved dagger in a golden scabbard was stuck into his golden belt. His beard was gray, and wisps of gray hair stuck out from under the fine, white cloth over his head. His skin was a sickly yellow color, and his lower lip had a strange slit in it on the right side, so that from time to time, spit dribbled out through it, which he dabbed at with a handkerchief. Uh, good night's work, men. Well done. I will make my selection. Then take the rest to the market in Mecca and get them sold. And he carried on his striding up and down, pointing at all the girls in Dr. Ponset's group and the two biggest, strongest boys, as well as a dark, sweet-faced girl, and some strong-looking black boys that Abraham didn't know. His men came and pulled them out from the crowd and took them to one side. Now, men, barked the man with a slit lip. Let's get the, all these pagan blacks to join the faithful. Get them lined up, my slaves first. The prisoners he had picked were pushed into a line, and the first one, a boy, was made to stand in front of one of the raiders. The leader stood back and watched. The raider grabbed the boy's chin in his hand and commanded, Repeat after me. There is no God but God, and Mohammed is his prophet. The boy clearly didn't understand a word he was saying and just stared at him dumbly. The raider slapped him round the face. Repeat, you pagan dog. There is no God. The boy began to get the idea, and stumbling and hesitating and repeated the words. The raider pushed him off to one side, and the next slave, a girl this time, came to the front. She stumbled out the words after him, and was pushed off in her turn. And so it went on, slave after slave. It's going to be our turn soon, muttered Abraham to the only two other children from the, his group who were still with him, Tadis and Afferwork, two boys quite a bit older than him. He knew neither of them spoke Arabic. What's going on? said Afferwork. What's everybody being made to say? Don't you see? exclaimed Abraham. They're all being made to swear they believe in the Muslim God. Uh, maybe most of them are just pagans, but... We're being made to swear it too, us Christians. We can't do that. We just can't. I think all the others just have, said Tadis quite calmly. But it's only words, isn't it? We don't have to believe in our hearts. How can you say such a thing? Burst out Abraham fiercely. That's, that, that's cheating. I don't think we have any choice, said Afferwork. But as he spoke, he and the other prisoners had been, who hadn't been picked up by the man with the slit lip were pushed into line. Afferwork was number seven, and with just a quick sideways glance at Abraham, he repeated the words. Tadis was number nine, and he repeated the oath too, looking down at his feet. Then came a girl, and finally Abraham, speaking a clear, confident Arabic. He knew now that he was what he was going to say. There is no God but God, 
and Muhammad is his prophet, and Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and Mary is his mother. The raider in charge stared at him. What did you say? Abraham stared straight back in the man's face and repeated what he had said. Without exactly meaning to, he lifted his two hands, still tied together at the wrist, up to the silver cross he wore on a string round his neck, and held it out. As he spoke this time, his voice wobbled. He couldn't help it. The Arab lifted his hand to strike. You dog, you Christian! But the voice of the man with the slit lip rang out. Stop! With a few quick strides, he was standing next to them. Move away, Kamal, he said to the guard. This boy interests me. He looked Abraham up and down. So you are a Christian, little boy. And how is it that a black like you doesn't worship sticks and stones? I am from Ethiopia, the land of the Christians. I worship one God just like you, said Abraham firmly. I am of the line of Solomon, king of the Jews. Hmm, muttered the Arab with a slit lip. You really are one of the children of the holy book. And an Ethiopian, too, though you don't look like one. Our prophet Muhammad had a soft spot for Ethiopians, you know, ever since they welcomed him in his hour of need. You have courage, I like that. I shall overlook your outburst. In fact, I have a mind not to sell you after all, but keep you here instead. He dabbed at the spit on his chin for a moment. On second thoughts, maybe you'd be a bit of a troublemaker. You can go and do that somewhere else. And keep that Christian cross of yours well hidden. Men, take these prisoners off to the slave market. And as the little group was gathered together to be given water and some dry, flat bread, Abraham suddenly found that he was shaking all over with a great rush of delayed fear, dizzy and sick and deathly cold in his stomach. He drank the water. It was awkward, holding the cup with his hands tied, but felt too sick for the bread though he had the sense to tuck it inside his clothes for later. So as the sun grew higher and its heat fiercer, Abraham's group, including Afferwork and Tadis, were formed into a line and marched off along the desert track to Mecca, their guards trotting up and down along the little caravan on their camels. To Abraham's dismay, he saw that Kamal, the guard who had nearly struck him, was one of them. Kamal, Kamal, as one of our Muslim merchants at home, was called that too. What a monster this is. You wouldn't catch this Kamal giving bread away and being kind to Christian children. He could see Lahaya now, wearing those fine clear blue beads with the swirling red and yellow patterns inside them, smiling up at the other Kamal. It's better not to remember things. As they marched, the hot sand burning its way even though, even through the thick, hard soles of Abraham's feet, he noticed that one of the guards was as black-skinned as he was. A peace be with you, he called up to the guard. And peace be with you. You speak good Arabic, boy. Uh, thank you. Are you an Arab then? I am a slave, as you are. The words were said kindly but they were like a slap across the face. A slave? Yes, that's what I am now. Um, when I left home, I was the emperor's special messenger to the king of the Franks. I was a son of a prince, and now I'm a slave. The cold and dizziness seized him again. Hardly knowing what he was saying, he mumbled. How did you come to be a slave? When I was a child in the land of the black people, I was out herding the cattle one day, and raiders caught me and carried me off to the sea. I was brought to Jeddah and sold to the king. The king? asked Abraham, confused. The only kings he could think of were the emperor Jesus the Great at Gondar and the king of the Franks. Uh, you saw him just now at his camp. Without thinking, Abraham touched the right side of his mouth. The guard went on. That's right. The one with the slit in his lip. He is the king of Mecca, but he loves nothing more than to live in the desert and do battle with his enemies and raid the caravans that come for the pilgrimage. 
Your friends who were chosen by him are now his slaves. What? What will become of the rest of us now? Well, at this time of the year, there are plenty of merchants who have come from far and wide to make the pilgrimage and buy and sell at the pilgrimage market while they are here. You could be bought by a merchant from anywhere and taken back to his land. What's your name, by the way? Abraham. Abraham? Ah, of course. We call him Ibrahim. Uh, it is your feast very soon. My name is Said, but it is too hot for walking now. We must rest. The path was full of pilgrims making their way toward the holy city, and a pilgrim's rest house was just ahead of them. A jumble of dried mud buildings and the long black tents of the desert Arabs. The children and their guards watched, and then washed, and then ate, and rested in one of the tents. And then, as Abraham, desperately tired, but too tired to sleep, lay in the hot shade, he couldn't help remembering. Oh, Granny, you always said to mind out for kidnappers. I did mind out, and now it's happened anyway. I belong to someone else now, someone I don't even know. And I'll never see home again, or mother or father, and there's Lahaya drowned because of me. And dear funny Dr. Ponsett, I don't even know if he's dead or alive. Suddenly the pain of losing them all seemed too much to bear, and he started to sob so hard that it hurt his whole body. Tadis and Afferwork came and stroked him with their bound hands, and Afferwork whispered, Abraham, uh, how can you cry? You're the strong one. You're the one who just uh, knows what to do. Don't give up. Just think. At least we're still alive. I don't think I want to be alive. Not if it's going to be like this. And he sobbed still more wildly. My mother's songs, when it says they leave us alone in strange lands, do you think our slaves at home felt like this? I never thought about it. Tadis and Afferwork looked at each other in bewilderment. What is it, Abraham? What are you talking about? What song? The Kunama, the slave people. Uh, our slaves at home. I always thought they were just, were happy. I mean... We played together. It was just normal, but they were taken from their homes, too. They had to belong to my father. And choking and sobbing, Abraham gasped out his mother's song of the children of the slave people. They came and catch us by the waters of the Mareb. They make us slaves. Our mothers in fear flee to the mountains and leave us alone in strange lands. They were in strange hands, and now we are, too. And, 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 and I'll never see my mother again. And Abraham sobbed and sobbed for himself and for the slaves at home and for everything that he would never see again. Kemal suddenly strode over, grabbed the cross around Abraham's neck and jerked him up off the ground so that the string cut into his flesh. He pulled his dagger out from its sheath. Abraham could feel the broad curved blade cold against his neck, even in this heat. The knife slid under the string, which suddenly snapped, and Kamal took the cross in his hand. He looked at it and spat. Well, we're not going to keep this, are we? He strode to the edge of the tent and flung the cross in a great spinning arc far out into the desert. Abraham stood, staring wordlessly. His tears shocked out of him. I've worn that cross since I was a baby. It's part of me. Kamal strolled back and laughed in his face. Not happy, are we, little monkey? I thought little monkeys liked playing. How about a little bit of monkey song and dance, then? Abraham simply stood and stared at him. A dance, monkey! Or sing something. Sing something in monkey language. Everyone was completely still, staring and then Saeed took Camille, Kamal by the arm and said quietly, Come on, leave him alone. It's getting cooler. Time to get on with the journey. Kamal glared at him and then shrugged. All right, time to get on with the journey. And so the last little piece of Ethiopia and the old life that Abraham had brought with him lay gleaming among the pebbles of the desert until in a little while the hot wind buried it in dust and grit. And as Abraham trudged along the path, up into the bare stony hills, bits of one 
of the Psalms of David that he had learnt for Abba Makal started floating into his mind until in the end he remembered the part that he wanted. By the rivers of Babylon there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we were remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there they that carried us away captive required us a song. And they that wa wasted us required of us mirth, saying, Sing of us the songs of Zion, how long we shall sing the Lord's song in a strange land. And Abraham remembered another Zion that he had seen at his father's side, a Zion in the land of Sheba, in Queen Makeda's country. And then he thought of his father's words to the emperor, Grandmothers by the fireside are already telling stories of his deeds. I won't give up hope. I won't give up hope. Maybe I am a slave, but you won't be ashamed of me, Father. Somehow, somehow I'll get to France after all. Lahea, you always said that if you want to do something badly enough and don't give up wanting it, you'll get it in the end. I won't be a slave forever. I will get free. And I will get to France. Uh, I'll get my message to the Sun King. I'll, I'll make sure of that. I'll show him that the youth of Ethiopia are the best in the world for wisdom and courage and high breeding, just as the emperor said. And then, very firmly, as he trudged along the hot, pebbly desert of Arabia, he said aloud two of his French sentences. My name is Abraham, and my father is a noble lord of Africa. The emperor of Ethiopia sends brotherly greetings to the king of the Franks. And that's the end of chapter 20.